Hello, welcome to the Rare Books Department at the J. Willard Marriott Library, the University of Utah. My name is Louise Poulton. In this virtual visit to Rare Books, we'll explore early books in Spanish, mostly having to do with Mexico, and develop a sense of studying past texts in their physical form as a way to enhance textual analysis. To hold contemporary books in hand as we study historical texts gives us a strong visceral sense of the who, what, when, where, and why of any written document. Most written documents produced after the manuscript era give us this frame of reference almost immediately. Printed material, especially books, often provide us with information such as who wrote the book, in other words, the author, what the book is, in other words, the title, when the book, that is, when the object we hold in our hands was made, and where the book was made. Not all of the books we will look at were produced at the time they were written. Why books were produced later than when they were written can tell us a story about the text all its own. We will begin with Mexican manuscripts and then explore three literary genres, language and its translation, histories, and government documents. Storytelling, whether fact or fiction, in whatever form or style, is universal. How those stories are compiled and preserved and passed on to others varies from one culture to another and from one time period to another. In the ancient Aztec culture, written literature was an important component of its narrative tradition. Written records kept information such as calendars, histories, rituals, and tributes for current and future Aztec. This Aztec manuscript has been identified as pre-Columbian. It likely originated south of Tenochtitlan along the Gulf Coast. It is possible that this work originated on the coast of Veracruz and that it was among the first consignment of Mexican treasures sent by Hernán Cortés to Charles V. The makers of this document did not leave the who, when, or where for us specifically. For this reason, the answers to these questions are surmised from the form, content, and style of the manuscript. We analyze Aztec and other Mesoamerican manuscripts using the same criteria with which we analyze all texts. The oldest page in the manuscript is similar to a style of that found in the Teutonic country. The deities depicted are members of the Aztec Toltec pantheon. The calendar, specifically the counts of days, are arranged in a series of dots representing suns. But when dealing with the numbers of things selected for offerings, the count is made in a bar and dot system like that used by the Maya. The accordion fold format is made of tanned deer skin prepared by scraping and smoking, then beating and rubbing it with fat. The skin was prepared for writing by adding a thick layer of quick drying lime paste with a hard surface, possibly achieved by lacquering the paint with chia seed oil. As for the paints, the red is probably cochineal, the others finely powdered minerals. The book deals thematically with the passage of life and its dangers. The opening page depicts the sun with the falling eagle descending into the dark clouds of sunset, which rise from the jaws of death, who is sacrificing a victim. On either side of the page, four pairs of deities stand on the earth. These are accompanied by a numerical sequence. Sometime between 1529 and 1553, following the Spanish conquest of central Mexico, a mendicant friar proselytizing among the Indians requested a native artist, or possibly several, to paint images of native deities, calendars, and customs. The images were accompanied by Spanish commentary intended to explain and record pre-conquest religion for the benefit of European trained missionary priests to help them understand native beliefs in order to combat their continued practice. The manuscript was copied many times, but the original exemplar is lost. 
Of the manuscript, anthropologist Zelia Nuttall wrote, there can be no doubt that the drawings in this were made by a Mexican whose work is characterized by an exceptionally clear execution of outline and detail and a perfect familiarity with the conventional conventionalism of native art. It was subsequently filled in by a copyist who did not complete his task. The text is in two handwritings. A change to a smaller and lighter round script is observable in the middle, but this difference is probably assignable to the writer's adoption of a fresh quill and his desire to concentrate the words into the limited space available. Notes are, however, written in the totally different running script of the 16th century. Certain passages seem to indicate that the anonymous author did not reside in the city of Mexico. To analyze this text, Nuttall looked at several factors, comparing these with other manuscripts and artifacts. She looked at handwriting, considered the tools with which the manuscript was made, such as the quill, and the need to replace quills as they wore down, the space the size of the page allowed, and the text itself, which indicated to her if not where exactly the manuscript was produced, then where it was not. This book was created in a codex format as opposed to the pre-Columbian accordion fold format of the Codex Loud we have just looked at, and the format of most ancient Aztec manuscripts. Still, Note that the pages are square, as were sections of the accordion fold, rather than the usual rectangular shape of European books. The shape of the page indicates possible copying of images from a much older manuscript. The original Codex Oben was produced in the format of a European book on European paper, rather than the more traditional rolls or accordion folds on bark or hide used in pre-Cortesian manuscripts. The original is small and divided into three parts plus an addendum that lists the secession of Mexica rulers and colonial officials. Each section opens with a full page painting, much as European books of the time did. Note the rectangular shape of the pages. Several hands, that is, the writers of the script and the glyphs, can be discerned throughout the manuscript, suggesting that it was a group project executed over many years. Like most Nahuatl annuals, Codex Alban was an anonymous record of the past, in which celestial as well as terrestrial events are recorded. The recording of the arrival of the Spanish is followed by the mention of death from smallpox. For these reasons, it is thought that perhaps Aztecs wrote this pictorial chronicle based on their collective memories, but under Spanish supervision. This is another early surviving illustrated manuscript. It was produced in the colonial Mexican province of Meshwakan. It is a standard European book form produced on laid paper, that is, standard European paper. The book was commissioned by the Spanish Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza. It was produced by a Franciscan friar who worked with indigenous noble informants and anonymous native artists. The text focuses primarily on the Tarascan culture. The pre-Columbian Tarascan state founded in the early 14th century, covered present-day Michoacan, parts of Jalisco, and Guanajuato. The ancient state consisted of a network of tributary systems, but grew increasingly centralized. According to oral tradition, it was founded by Tariakuri and was dominated by his lineage. The capital was located near Lake Pazucuaro. Until the Spanish appeared, it fought numerous wars with the Aztec Empire, blocking Aztec expansion to the Northwest. At the time of the Spanish conquest, it was the second largest state in Mesoamerica. Still, it was relatively isolated and had many distinct cultural traits that disappeared after the conquest. 
It was one of the few Mesoamerican civilizations to use metal for tools, decoration, and weapons. We can and should ask the same questions of each text we read. Why are texts written and for whom? Why are texts recorded onto stable materials with the intent of a lasting existence? Here is one example for which we have a clear answer. Codex Asuna is a set of seven separate documents produced in early 1565 to present evidence against the Spanish government of Viceroy Luis de Velasco, who ruled Mexico between 1563 and 1566. The study was made by Geronimo de Valderrama, who was set to sent to Mexico for this purpose by order of Philip II of Spain. Indigenous leaders claimed non-payment for various goods and services, including building construction and domestic help performed by their people. Daily jobs such as farming, harvesting, cleaning, and decorating are depicted. One particularly evocative scene illustrates a trip to Florida by a man on horseback, followed by natives in Castilian dress accompanied by Spanish soldiers. The documents include declarations of the accused and eyewitnesses. The original codex was strictly pictographic. Nahuatl transcribed into the Roman alphabet and a Castilian translation was added by Spanish administrators. Note that the production of the original documents came while there were printing presses in New Spain. Yet these documents were produced by hand. Certainly at this stage in the development of printing, particularly in a so-called new land, preparing images, adding color, and adding notes by hand was still the easiest, most effective way to produce a document such as this. In other words, the kinds of technology available to produce books is an important consideration in textual analysis. Printer Pedro Bali was a native of Salamanca who arrived in Mexico sometime around 1569 as a bookseller. By 1574, he was printing, the fourth printer of record in New Spain by a royal decree of King Philip II. The title page bears a large woodcut of the Jesuit logo, one of the earliest instances of that device's appearance in a book published in Mexico. The text contains eight woodcuts, five of which are historiated. Artemexicana, a grammar of Nahuatl, is the first printed work by a mestizo, the first published indigenous language work written by a native Nahuatl speaker, and the first work in an indigenous language of Mexico written by a Jesuit. Born not quite two generations after the completion of the conquest of Mexico, Antonio del Rencon was a mestizo native of Texcoco, a descendant of that state's nobility. It is very likely that his family was still using Nahuatl as its first language. Rencon was as fa facile in Nahuatl as he was in Spanish. He entered the Jesuit order in August of 1573, the year after the Jesuits arrived in Mexico. Rencon's comprehension of Nahuatl as it was spoken in the post-colonial period was particularly helpful in creating this successful grammar. Rencon's grammar contains an 18-page list of all the Nahuatl words used in it. Texts such as these can be analyzed for important cultural exchanges and how they took place. In this case, the exchange was language, difficult at best to fully and accurately explicate. Rancon was the first Mexican linguist to recognize the significance of certain aspects of Nahuatl, such as the duration of the sounded vowel and the glottal closure. Rancon also first proposed the interpretation of the meaning of the name Mexico as in the middle of the moon. His grammar was in constant demand for nearly a century until its use was eclipsed by a 1645 grammar produced by another Jesuit. 
Juan Bautista was born in Mexico. A professor, he was a prolific writer, publishing more in Mexico than any other law author in his lifetime. Like Rancón, Bautista was particularly sensitive to accuracy of translation between Spanish and Nahuatl and Latin and Nahuatl. He delved into Nahuatl to find native words instead of relying on Spanish loanwords. Bautista believed that the difficulty of translation, in particular of the three-in-one formulation of the Holy Trinity, was partly to blame for the inability of the Indian to confess in the manner of Europeans. Advertentius, directed towards confessors of indigenous penitents, is a comprehensive handbook based on canon law. The first volume of this edition, printed in double columns, is written in Spanish and Nahuatl, punctuated with quotations in Latin. Bautista suggested that confessors and other church ministers carefully regard their own actions in light of their own faith. He urged the confessor to be flexible and supportive when taking confessions regarding incest, marital infidelity, and other sins. Above all, he pleaded for mild and charitable interactions with the Indians. His approach is in contra contrast to the strict Dominican administration. Still, Bautista, like the Dominicans, denied the intellectual ability of the Indians to understand or accurately describe their sins. Beyond the basic tenets of faith, they could not be trusted to understand more. This book was printed by Melchior Ocarte, son of Pablos, who continued his father's print shop after his death. Like most trades, Printing was passed down from one family member to another, allowing the continuation of businesses for decades. Augustin de Vettencourt was a Franciscan historian and scholar of Nahuatl. In the 17th century, the study of Nahuatl reached its apex through the dedicated work of 16th century Franciscan scholars. Vettencourt, a vicar in Mexico City, perfected his understanding of Nahuatl in this role. Vettencourt began his grammar with the insight that prescribed study of European languages had its shortcomings when applied to New World languages, although in the end, he was hard pressed to find his way around the current pedagogy. It is interesting to see how Vettencourt appended his work. He included a comprehensive index, a short catechism, and instructions on the commandments and the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, all in Nahuatl. This is the first translation into Castilian of the Roman Catechism of the Council of Trent, first published in Rome in 1566 by the descendant of the great early printer Aldus Manutius. The Roman Catechism was, of course, in Latin, it was translated into several European vernaculars, which almost immediately began a long and heated controversy over the desirability of translating sac sacred texts into the so-called vulgar tongues. Other older catechisms had been translated into vernacular, but the Roman catechism faced translation objections, including how difficult translation would be and the need for a delicacy no vernacular could offer. It was argued that the theology within the catechism was simply too difficult for the layperson to understand. In 1567, Pope Pius V commissioned the president of the Council of Castile and Inquisidor General to have the catechism translated into Spanish. The translation was done by a theologian, but vetoed by the Spanish Inquisition, despite the support of Philip II. It took 200 years for an accepted translation into Castilian, and the first Castilian translation was accompanied by a translation into Nahuatl. Augustinian priest Manuel Perez was the best Mexican linguist of his time. He taught Nahuatl at the University of Mexico for 22 years. In his foreword to his translation, he wrote of his dedication to the study of Nahuatl. The parallel text is Castilian and Nahuatl, 
Perez intersperses his lexicographical reflections on the use of certain Nahuatl terms, noting, for example, that he, on occasion, retains an expression in Castilian because there is no equivalent in the Mexican language. He does not merely explain when and why he uses a borrowing from Spanish, but also explains the reasons why a Spanish expression has been translated into Nahuatl. The printing includes a dedication in Spanish and a preface in Latin. The first Spanish translation of the Roman Catechism was printed in Mexico City, still remembered as Tenochtitlan by a large part of its population. Texts in native tongues were essential to evangelization. In the absence of such texts, Jesuit missionaries often created their own. Basque Jesuit Geronimo Ripalda is known for his catechism, first published in 1591 in Burgos, then printed in Madrid in 1618. It was especially popular in the southern half of Spain. Ripalda's catechism was translated into Nahuatl, Otomi, Tarasco, Zapeco, and Maya. The Nahuatl translation was done by Ignacio de Pérez. Pérez was born in Mexico in 1704, became a Jesuit, and spent his life studying Nahuatl. The translation was reprinted in Mexico in 1809 and 1831. The book is printed in Spanish and Nahuatl with preliminaries and headers in Spanish. Pérez introduced the work with an essay on reason for the work to the reader, in which he states that the first reason is to have a brief teaching manual and, second, to have a single text for Mexican Christians since the Castilian Catechism of Ripalda is used everywhere. The Catechism is preceded by a description of saints and religious festivals. There is also an explanation of doctrine and then a discussion of doctrine in the form of questions and answers. It is this front matter that makes this particular publication important. The volume is completed by a small doctrine of Bartholomew Brown a Jesuit. As a whole, the book is a practical manual of Catholic theology for Mexico and its native populations. Language and its consequences are important ways to study a culture and its people and the ways one language and therefore culture can influence another. Here is an example of the study of Spanish sayings. Fernando Guzman was a Spanish humanist and an eminent biblical scholar. He studied Greek, Latin, Hebrew, and Arabic. Beginning in 1508, Guzman began compiling a collection of Spanish sayings and adages. The work contains more than 9,000 entries and is glossed with comments and parallel sayings from other languages, including Catalan, Galician, Portuguese, French, Italian, Asturian, Latin, and Greek. The sayings are listed in alphabetical order with an indication of the language for those other than Spanish. The compilation was at press when the author died. Guzman's student, Leon de Castron, wrote the prologue. Refranos was reprinted several times, each imprint unique, as proverbs were censored for being anti-clerical or obscene, and sometimes later readmitted. This is the binding of our copy. It is plain, but worth talking about. What can the binding of a book tell us about its contents, its owner, its life? Until the early 18th century, books were not usually sold in bindings. The text block was available from a bookseller, and the purchaser would then contract with a bookbinder to provide a protective covering. The quality of the binding ranged in price, our copy was bound in this simple vellum binding. Vellum is specially prepared animal skin. This was, for at least a couple of centuries, the least expensive, most common binding. An inexpensive but serv serviceable binding like this can suggest several things. The owner was not particularly wealthy, or the owner did not feel that this particular text 
warranted much money spent on a binding. What we can be grateful for is that the binding helped protect the text. Why are texts written and for whom? Why are texts recorded onto stable materials with the intent of a lasting experience? We'll ask these questions again. In 1525, a royal order granted printer Jacobo Kroberger a monopoly on the book trade in New Spain. In 1539, the first print shop was established through a contract between Kroberger and another printer. Kroberger had print shops in Mexico and Spain. Mexico, or Nueva España, was of vital interest to Spain, of course. What went on in Mexico had a direct impact on Spain and vice versa. Once the Spanish government settled in Spain, laws enacted in Spanish governments on both continents needed to be codified and clarified. Bartolomeo de las Casas was a major force behind the passage in 1542 of Spanish laws prohibiting indigenous slavery and safeguarding the rights of the indigenous peoples of Mexico. He was met with powerful opposition for his pleas on behalf of the natives but he captured the attention of Charles V, who eventually made de las Casas a bishop for his philanthropic work. De las Casas marred his record as a social reformer by condoning the enslavement of black Africans in order to spare the Indians. His writings were widely translated and widely read. English translations of his works were used to foment English feeling against the Spanish and to promote the belief that Spanish colonies would be better off in English hands. This particular book is one of eight treatises by de las Casas printed by Kroberger in Seville between 1552 and 1553. The treatises propose remedies for the systemic treatment of indigenous peoples in Mexico and includes 20 reasons proving that they should not be enslaved by the Spanish. We might wonder about these publications. Why 10 years after the passage of the laws did de las Casas, uh, the laws that de las Casas advocated for, were these published? Why publish these separately? Eventually, the treatises could be collected, bound, and sold as one book. Interestingly, however, the treatises survived more often in their pamphlet form instead of collected in a bound book. Who was the audience for these treatises? Studying histories requires paying attention to the to who, what, when, and where. This history of the quote unquote conquest of Mexico is a case in point. Antonio de Solis, a playwright, was Secretary of State to Philip IV. Recognized for his literary skills, he was appointed Chief Chroniclers of the Indies in 1667. In his work, first printed in Madrid in 1684, he chronicled the years between the appointment of Hernán Cortés to command the Spanish army to the Americas and the fall of Mexico City. Solis included a section on the relationship between Cortés and Montezuma. He also gave detailed descriptions of the lives of the native populations of Mexico, including religious beliefs and rites, idols, hymns, industries, arts, crafts, and games. Solis underscored the courage of the conquistadors as they fought the, quote, savage, unquote, indigenous peoples. Solis's work is a secondary source, using some primary but mostly secondary source material. His principal sources were the letters of Cortez, the works of Francisco Lopez de Gomara, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, and miscellaneous documents. Solis was not eyewitness to the meeting between Cortez and Montezuma, nor to what took place in Mexico after that meeting. His sources were all Spanish and did not include the voice of any other than the Spanish. The work was extremely popular, printed numerous times in many languages in the next three centuries, 
influencing European sensibilities about an encounter that changed the world more than 100 years before this book was first printed. Books in this period were often dedicated to some notable who may have supported the publication of it monetarily. Often, too, the dedication worked for publisher and author as endorsement. This dedicatory page is embellished with the large woodcut showing the arms of the dedicatee, Dong Guillen. After the conquest of Tenochtitlan, Hernán Cortés sent a series of letters to Carlos I, King of Spain. The letters were reports carefully designed to defend Cortés's credentials as commander and loyal subject, but also to justify his shaky legal position. He was technically in rebellion against the crown for having rejected the authority of his superior, the governor of Cuba. The letters then are fictional embellishments of the conquest written as fact, painting its leader as an extraordinary military strategist who will eventually win a new empire for his king. Three surviving letters are republished here. This edition also includes historical material, an essay by 17th century Franciscan Augustin de Betancourt, a reproduction of a Mexican manuscript, and commentary based on his own research by the editor, Antonio Lorenzana. The edition includes copper plate engravings and maps one of them based on a 1541 representation of the coast of the Southern Sea. This is a masterpiece of Mexican colonial printing and book production. Lorenzana, Archbishop of Mexico from 1766 to 1772, deliberately promoted the printing arts in Mexico during his term. The Mexican printing presses had become as sophisticated as any in Europe, enabling the finely detailed copper plates and maps. The printing is solid on strong, high quality paper. Friar Bernardino Sahugun was one of the first Catholic missionaries to the Aztec. During his stay in Mexico, which began in 1529, he became fluent in Nahuatl and gained an intimate comprehension of Aztec culture, customs, religion, and infrastructure. He compiled a large and richly detailed record of the Aztec and their history before the Spanish conquest. It is worthwhile comparing this history of Mexico with that of Antonio de Solis. Sahagún's work was an early European attempt of analysis from the subject's point of view by using native informants in his research. The work written in 1540 was originally an illustrated manuscript of 12 books in a combination of Nahuatl and Spanish. This first printed edition is in Spanish only. Topics include government and monarchy, gold and precious stone industry, sacrificial div divination, and Aztec theology and moral philosophy. Here is another history of Mexico written in manuscript form in the mid 16th century. The author, Diego Duran, was a Dominican friar. Like the manuscript work of Sahagun, Duran is one of the earliest books on the history and culture of the Aztec written by a Westerner who lived in Mexico. Duran was born in Spain. He traveled with his family to Mexico as a toddler. While in Texcoco, he learned Nahuatl. His family moved to Mexico City, where he was exposed to Aztec culture under colonial rule. Duran's book was much criticized during his lifetime for his sympathetic attitude toward the Aztec peoples and their culture. He wrote, quote, some persons, and they are not a few, say that my work will revive ancient customs and rights among the Indians, unquote. Duran's manuscript, probably finished by 1581, remained unpublished until it was found in the Library of Madrid. The manuscript contains 78 chapters spanning the Aztec creation story 
to post-colonialism. It included a chronology of the Aztec kings. Although Duran's sources are unknown, it was typical of 16th century writers to borrow material from others without citation. Certainly, Duran worked closely with the Aztec and would have gained much of his knowledge from them. Duran himself was cited by Augustin de Villa Padilla in his later history. The entire run of the first volume of this publication was confiscated by the government of Mexico. The printer Ramirez left Mexico soon after. In 1880, volume two and an atlas volume were published under the direction of the then director of the Museo Nacional. What does the first 19th century printed publication of the 16th century manuscripts of Sahugun and Duran suggest to us about the reception or lack of toward histories based on the study of indigenous populations as opposed to histories based on the stories of the Spanish conquistadors. The study of maps may not, at first glance, warrant textual analysis. Maps are important components of history, however, and can tell us much about the interests surrounding other texts. We have seen, for instance, the maps included in the first Mexican printing of the letters of Cortez, some 200 years after his arrival in Mexico. Maps were added as an integral perspective, both visual and textual, for readers. I have focused on publications that give us a view of Mexico before and after the arrival of Cortez, a history of great interest and significance to both indigenous peoples and Europeans. But the world, of course, was larger than this important region. I'll take this opportunity to step out of Mexico for a brief look at that world. Maps help us and helped earlier readers understand the bigger picture of a world that was growing smaller and smaller in its interconnections between one area and another. This pocket atlas describes the world at the end of the 17th century. It contains detailed fold-out maps depicting bodies of water, rivers, forests, mountain ranges, routes, and place names. The maps include distance scales and longitude and latitude. The atlas was first printed in 1696. It was written by Francisco de Efferden, a Belgian cartographer based in Antwerp, then the Spanish Netherlands, and printed in Madrid on behalf of Francisco Lasso, a Madrid book merchant. It's multiple further printings in 1696, 1709, and 1711 attest to its popularity among Spanish readers. Each edition was small enough to carry around in one satchel or even pocket, easily fitting into two hands and ready to refer to at any time. In the early 1700s, this is what North and South America looked like to European readers. The final map in this collection shows California as an island. Giovanni Paoli was born near the turn of the 16th century in northern Italy, but became known in Mexico as Juan Pablos, the founder, in collaboration with Spanish printer Jacob Kroberger of the first printing press in the Americas. Pablos established his press in Mexico City in 1539. He ran the press until his death in 1563, at which time his son-in-law, Pedro Ojarte, took over its operation. Ojarte was detained and tortured at the hands of the Spanish Inquisition. Labeled a heretic, he allegedly printed a book that questioned the necessity of praying to saints. After lengthy court proceedings, he was acquitted of the charges and eventually allowed to resume printing which he did until his death in 1592. Printing could be dangerous business. What got printed and what didn't and when is something to consider when studying historical texts. The documents here, one printed by Juan Pablos in 1560, the other by Ojarte in 1587, 
are powers of attorney. Both documents, printed in black and red, begin with the same phrase. In English, loosely translated as, let it be known that the following individuals are witnesses to the authenticity of this document. This is followed by signatures of several individuals. The printed portion then resumes, detailing what powers the client is agreeing to give to his or her attorney. At the end of these sections is handwritten cursive before final signatures and notarization. The broadsides are, in fact, generic copies which could be amended to the needs of a particular client by adding more legal wording afterwards by hand. Large stocks of notarial forms were kept, often used years after they were printed. Printed and handwritten documents such as these, however brief and ephemeral they might be, are helpful in understanding contemporary circumstances surrounding larger, more detailed texts. For instance, enslaved people are mentioned as assets in the 1560 document, although they are not uh, discussed in the 1587 document. Like the early 16th century documents of powers of attorney that we just considered, documents of data were an essential component of understanding and running a vast world. With this publication, we get a good sense of Spanish laws regarding activities in Mexico. Increased mining of silver in 18th century Mexico resulted in increased wealth for the mine owners and the crown. Only miners born in Spain were allowed to possess copies of this book of royal decrees regarding the mining industry. The decrees addressed the discovery of new mines, the operation of old ones, the training of workers and royal officials, the duties of experts, the introduction of new technology, the requirements for purity of blood, and many more aspects of the most important economic activity of Mexico's colonial period. As befits a book published only for the wealthy and notable, the book was a rather lavish production, in spite of its rather perfunctory contents large and with lots of white space, the typesetting is an excellent example of the beautiful, luxurious Caslon font. The use of this type is interesting. Typefaces can, in fact, tell us much about the production, the content, and the intended audience of a book. The use of Caslon for this particular publication is a case in point. William Caslon was an Englishman, born in 1692. He began work as a gun engraver, his work in a metal foundry, giving him a knowledge of the working properties of steel, um, led him to learn the rudiments of punch cutting and type founding. He produced his first typeface in 1724. Within 10 years, he had cut typefaces in Arabic, Hebrew, Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, and Greek, as well as several Roman types. His types illustrate his attention to early typographical and even earlier scriptorial traditions. His most lasting typeface, Caslon, was modeled after Dutch types of the 17th century, when, in fact, Holland was part of the Spanish Netherlands. In contrast to the Book of Royal Decrees, this publication tells us a very different story about Mexico 35 years later. This is the second official Mexican printing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which delivered to the United States an addition of land equal to the size in size to the Louisiana and Alaskan purchases. The first printing was made a few months after this, uh, before this one. This printing includes protocols necessary for the conclusion of the treaty. The full text text appears in English and Spanish on facing pages. Amendments made to the treaty by the United States were added, following, followed by a statement of the Mexican commissioners dated May 30, 1848, accepting the modifications. The typographical decorations and elaborate initials belie the gravity and tragedy of the text. The second edition concludes with a protocol attempting to put the best light 
on the treaty by Mexican signatories who stressed that Mexico was poor, internally divided, and unprepared for a struggle with the much more stable and prosperous United States. The treaty ended war between the United States and Mexico, but resulted in the cession of 55% of Mexican territory, what is now New Mexico, California, Arizona, Texas, and parts of Colorado, Nevada, and Utah. Agreements were reached for the withdrawal of American troops from Mexico and the payment of $15 million for Mexican claims. Mexico's independence from Spanish rule in 1821 had propelled it into the modern age and stimulated the circulation of new ideas. But on the heels of independence came devastating invasions, particularly those of the United States. Under these conditions, printed material was often of limited production. Physical conditions were inadequate. A lack of basic materials such as movable type and paper curtailed Mexican printing. There is nothing luxurious about the printing of this document of such importance to Mexican citizens. From political tragedy for one people to national romanticism for another, I'll end by stepping outside of Mexico one more time with a look at the increasing variety of Spanish literary voices highlighted in this collection focusing on Spanish personality and cultural identity. This compilation of pieces written by the most notable Spanish writers of the time was published by bookseller Ignacio Bois, a central figure in the Madrid publishing world. The collection was first printed in two volumes between 1843 and 1844 as Mexico struggled with its identity and reprinted in 1841 as Mexicans, now Americans, struggled with their identity in a single volume. Writers included journalists, essayists, critics, and a few anonymous characters such as the solitary and curious speaker. The collection is illustrated with woodcuts, a technique at which Spanish engravers became particularly adept during this period. The whole project was based on a French publication loosely translated as The French Painted by Themselves, printed between 1839 and 1840. The collection can tell us much about the cousins of the Spanish conquistadors. Three centuries after Spain entered into a new engagement with the world and with themselves. We end, I think appropriately, with El Escribano, without whom we would know nothing of Mexico, Spain, or the world. We have scanned nearly all of these books in full. You can find them by visiting our Rare Books digital collections. For more about Rare Books, our collections and services, visit our website, where you can find our digital exhibitions, including more books about Mexico, view more vi digital lectures, and subscribe to our blog, Open Book. We're happy to help you in any way we can. Please contact us, and thank you.